Hello, everyone, and welcome back. My name is Cody Niedermeyer, and I'm the host of our BFG webinar series. Um, I am a CFP candidate and an associate in our office who works directly with our lead advisors in developing plans and implementing those plans for our clients. Um, today, we are lucky enough to have our favorite guest back, who's been on the most times, Eric Brotman. Uh, before we dive into anything, Eric, I just want everyone to know that we will have a Q&A at the end of this for those who have done it before or who have tuned in before. Uh, at the end of our webinar series, we like to take 10 to 15 minutes and try to answer any questions that come about from any of our listeners. Uh, so if you can please send in those questions, we'll have our director of marketing, Sarah, pop on and she'll pick a few of those so, uh, so we can pick Eric's brain a little bit more than uh, we're going to do during our... Uh, webcast but eric welcome to the show uh we're so excited to have you back thanks it's good to be here and, and i i worry that you're going to pick my brain it's slim pickings right now i'm on summertime yeah you're enjoying the beach out there i'm uh i'm definitely jealous but like i said we're lucky enough to have you tuning in even from the beach because uh you know you really do enjoy these and i know our listeners from the feedback that we've gotten really appreciate it every time that you're on so thank you for doing that for us let's do it all right well, based on this top screen and what everybody's been seeing is today we're going to talk about the beginner's guide to investing. And the best place to start with that is obviously the disclosure, but clearly what is, what is investing, Eric? Uh, sometimes it's important when you describe what investing is to first understand what it isn't. Um, okay. What it isn't is it isn't necessarily speculating. It isn't designed to be gambling. It's designed to be um, deploying capital in a place where you expect a reasonable return on that capital. So okay. uh, it, there are lots of different kinds of investments and lots of ways to do that. And the difference between investing and just saving, for example, because in saving you're deploying capital and looking for return on that capital, um, is that you're anticipating by taking on some additional risk of your principal at times, you're anticipating a more substantial return. Um, which you don't get typically in a savings or money market or, or a certificate or other type of, of cash vehicle. So investing is really a way to try to grow money over time. Um, and it's it's not a game, despite the fact that lots of websites have gamified this. It's not a game. It's real money and it needs to be taken seriously. So you would say it's not a way of getting rich quick or anything of that nature? Uh, no. In fact, um, any time there feels like a, a herd that is running towards something to get rich quick, so to speak, uh, it's a good time to put yourself in reverse and get away from that because typically um, that ends very, very poorly for the vast majority of people in the stampede. Yeah, you would think that once everybody knows about it, you've, you've kind of missed the hump on it and uh, you're going to be catching it on the back end. Uh, at the very least. It could be worse than that. So yeah, it, no, this is this is not designed to, to create wealth quickly. It's designed to create wealth strategically, sometimes mm -hmm. tactically, uh, but definitely over time. The greatest variable, when you look at the formula for investment success, the variable that plays the biggest role isn't your rate of return. It's the number of years involved. Time is the single most valuable piece of that pie. And so when we start talking about how to create and how to build wealth, the most powerful piece of that uh, equation is time. Now, investment return matters, so do deposits and the frequency of those deposits. Are, you know, are you making a one-time investment or are you making an investment with every paycheck? And I know you want to talk about the different ways to do that, but yeah. the reality is that this is designed to be a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and uh, folks should not be you know, day trading and jumping in and out of securities. That is a, a, a recipe for disaster. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you would say, or would you say that investing is more focused on, you know, just reaching long-term goals or, you know, if used properly, it could also be used to reach those short-term goals as well. Well, investing for short-term is usually investing for income okay. uh, as opposed to investing for appreciation. Appreciation requires time. It requires uh, securities to grow in value over a period of years or decades even. Um, and, you know, that is a totally different type of investing than investing for, let's say, you, uh, you know, buying a home or, or paying for college or, yeah. or doing some of the things that are shorter term 
Um, sometimes those require only saving. Sometimes they can uh, they can involve investing, but it needs to be handled very differently than something you're hoping will uh, essentially be your own personal endowment and grow into something you can take income from for the rest of your life. Yeah. So it really does depend on you know what goals you have. But um, no, I think that's a great broad overview, and we're definitely going to be diving into a few of the things that you've already touched on a bit. So one of the best ways I think to start this is you know what can you invest in? Uh, there's been terms thrown around such as traditional investments versus non-traditional um, stocks versus bonds. Um, where would you start with a client coming to you and saying, you know, what do I even have the ability of investing in? Um, well, let's start with what people invest in. You can invest in almost anything. Um, you know, traditional investments are stocks, bonds, and cash. Um, stock is when you're buying um, a, a piece of the equity in a company, whether it's a private company or a public one. Um, bonds are a fixed income instrument. They're a way to lend money for a return in the form of a coupon or an interest payment. And then cash speaks for itself generally. Um, but there are dozens of, if not hundreds of other types of investments, and they can range from uh, commercial or residential real estate to private debt to commodities or natural resources or agriculture or precious metals. Um, they can be startup companies and angel investing. It can be venture capital. Um, there's lots of different ways to deploy funds. Um, certainly to suggest that all of them are appropriate for everyone would be fool's errand. Um, a lot of this depends on where you are and where you're starting. And so you, the second part of your question, which was how do we start with clients? We always start in the same spot, which is analysis mm -hmm. and inventory. Where are you right now? What resources do you have? How soon might you need them? You know, you don't invest your emergency fund. The, the fund that you need in case your washer and dryer blow up tomorrow is not the same as the fund you plan to, to use in some form of financial independence in your 70s. It's, it's just a totally different animal. So you have to invest very differently, but you can invest in anything. People invest in artwork. They invest in collectibles. They invest in baseball cards. I mean, it could be any number of things. Traditionally, when people talk about an investment portfolio, they're talking about stocks, bonds, cash, and other either marketable or potentially illiquid securities. Okay. So it, like you said, it, it really is understanding where you're currently at and what you're trying to achieve in order to kind of back in to what's the right investments for you, because there's a multitude of options when you really break it down and look at everything. Well, you always have to start where you are. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, no sense in, there's no sense in beating yourself up for where you've been or what you have or haven't done, whether you've had investment success in the past or not, whether you've had investment experience in the past or not. Um, I, I think you, you have certain variables that, that change only based on your life. So your, your age, your net worth, your income, your family status, your health. Um, some of these things are quantitative um, and some of them are qualitative. Um, and then, of course, your objectives, what's important to you. For some people, the idea of investment success um, is, is having enough money to work one job instead of two someday. And for some, having investment success is buying a house on the Riviera. So I, I think it's impossible to define that for the same, you know, it's impossible to define that exactly the same for, for lots of different kinds of people. Which is the whole idea of avoiding any type of blanket statement because everybody's an individual and everybody is unique. It's very rare that someone shows up at our office and there's something in their questionnaire or in their documents that we've never seen before. Yeah. But that said, we've never seen that exact combination before. And that's part yeah. of what makes it fun is that every single situation is unique. And that is the enjoyable part of this is is not only being able to to help solve problems or prevent them, um, but to be able to look at each one, not just as a math problem, because quite frankly, that gets boring quickly. Um, it's looking at the math problem in the context of, of a life mm -hmm. that needs to be well lived. Yeah, no, definitely keeps us on our toes and definitely keeps us busy. But um, so let's say I'm a listener right now and I'm trying to figure out, you know, where I'm at. So I understand I'm an individual and I'm unique. What are the different types of investors? Um, I know a term or terms that we like to throw it down, throw around, excuse me, are there's buyers, there's sellers, and there's also holders. And how do you understand what each one of those are? And then how do you understand which one you are? First of all, thanks for not throwing it down. It's not that kind of webinar. Um, 
I, I, I would no, say that <laughs> there, there are only, ultimately, there's only three ways to treat a various investment or security. You're either buying shares of something mm -hmm. or you're selling shares of something or you've owned it and you're just buying and holding it. And okay. what's important is to understand not just where you are as an investor, but where your accounts are and making sure that they're aligned. So for example, you don't have to be only one of those three things. So here's sure. what I mean. Um, I'm at a point where my personal retirement goal is to continue to save and invest and grow my retirement portfolio. So there I'm a buyer. I'm buying with every paycheck or every month or both. Um, but in other places, you know, I've, I've got a kid to educate and I'm actually using college savings plans in ways where I'm actually making withdrawals to help pay tuition. So there I'm a seller. So it's not that you're one or the other. I might have one account where I'm a seller and one account where I'm a buyer, or I may have a, a, accounts like, for example, for people who've worked at prior uh, with prior employers, and let's say they had a prior 401k and now it's in an IRA someplace but they're working again for another employer and they have a new 401k. It's perfectly possible to be a buyer in that 401k with your new employer, but to be a holder of that IRA because it's parked. And so treating those differently matters. Generally, it's uh, more palatable for someone trying to grow wealth. It's more palatable to take on some additional market risk where you're a buyer. That's not to suggest that everyone should. No blanket statements here, but it's to suggest that in uh, in a case of somebody who's in their 20s or 30s or 40s or even 50s and who's trying to accumulate wealth, you can handle more volatility in an account where you're buying regularly because of dollar cost averaging. You're taking advantage of some of that volatility as instead of being a bit of a sitting duck as a holder. And the best example of this was in the the, the Great Recession, the financial crisis of 08, 09 where people who were buyers look back on that as one of the greatest opportunities of all time because they had a 40% to 65% reset in various asset classes. And as buyers, they made a lot of money over time. Holders lost five years of their lives. People who planned to retire you know, five years later now had to work an extra couple of years because they were holders and they had to wait for recovery of the market. Sellers arguably will never recover to this day. Because wow. it's like it's like chopping uh, branches off of the money tree instead of just picking fruit. At some point, there'll be less fruit. And so, uh, it, you know, being a seller during a market like that is incredibly dangerous. And so it's real important that if you are using your investments for income, that they are segregated from the assets you're trying to use to grow because they are completely different. And it's OK for one investor to have two or even three of these different kinds of strategies em employed at the same time. So you really don't have to just be one. It's really looking at your entire portfolio as one versus each asset or as in each asset. But that actually raises two questions for me that I think some of the listeners might be asking. First off, sure. a term that you used of dollar cost averaging. I think a lot of people are doing that and kind of not even realizing it in employer plans. Could you give a brief definition of that for, for the listeners? Dollar cost averaging means that you're you're investing a specific dollar amount into some security on a regular basis, regardless of the cost of the security. So if you're putting $100 a check into the XYZ security in your 401k, you're doing that $100 a check, whether that security goes up or down in value. So some months you buy more shares than others. Okay. That is dollar cost averaging. And the objective there is to without thinking about it, to be buying the dips when market prices drop a little bit and to be gaining appreciation through the years. Now, dollar cost averaging isn't magic. It's not a, there's no magic bullet. It's not a guarantee of anything, but it's a reasonable uh, and logical approach to investing that does two things. One, it allows you to keep on track and make sure you're doing what you're doing. And two, it relieves us of the psychological torture that comes with making an investment of, is this a good time or not? If you're investing every two weeks through your paycheck, you're not thinking about, is this a good time to do this? What was the news du jour? And so it, it, it allows us all as human beings to demystify and be dispassionate about that decision because there's no decision to make. It's just happening. We know what we're putting in per year. We know it's going to happen every check or every month. And that's okay no matter what markets are doing. That's dollar cost averaging in a nutshell.
Okay. Yeah. Thank you for definitely diving into that. I think a lot of people do it and have no idea what the term is or anything like that. So thank you for breaking that down. Sure. Second thing is what about those, you know, viewers and listeners that are saying, Oh, like I could time the market and figure out when's the best time to sell when the best time to buy is. And what are some reasons why, you know, they're probably not as capable as they think they might be. Lots of us have a bias referred to as overconfidence. Yes. Um, and that's true in all aspects of life. If you had a room of 100 people in it and you asked everyone who thought they were an above average driver to raise their hands, you'd probably get 95 out of 100 hands up. And that's either because five people are being realistic or they weren't listening to you. Um, we all think we're better than average. And that's naturally impossible by its very nature of what is the average. Um, when it comes to investment acumen, um, being educated and understanding how these things work is not the same as being able to manage your own psychology and your own behavior to make good decisions and to make them in a dispassionate way. It's one of the reasons why great athletes have personal trainers and star tennis players have coaches. You'd think, why do you need a coach? You're one of the best. Yeah. Well, th how do you think I got there? And why do you think I'm still there? So there's a, a natural tendency for us to be overconfident in our abilities. And um, it, it is over time, not just difficult, but impossible to beat or time anything. Th there's there's right. no manager in history who's been able to do that. Even if they have 10 or 13 year positive runs, there's always a point where that doesn't work. And sometimes when it doesn't work, it doesn't work spectacularly. So I don't try to time anything ever. Now, are there exceptions to that? Are there reasons why you might make an adjustment? Well, sure. One of them might be related to your age. One of them might be related to your employment. Did you get a big raise or did you or your spouse lose your job? Well, that'll change your investment horizon or, or the way you treat your money. Um, that's not a timing issue based on what you think is coming in the markets. There, if, if it was possible to time that, the top money managers in the world would all hire those people and it would we wouldn't need 20,000 different funds to invest in because there'd be seven that were right all the time. Well, clearly that's yeah. not a, that's not true for a reason or it'd be the only ones out there. The other timing things are around tax policy or, um, or other types of, of legislative uh, issues where you can say, well, it makes sense to time this transaction because capital gains rates are changing or because I'm in an abnormally high or abnormally low tax bracket this year. So there are tactical decisions to be made in investing. Timing the market is not one of them, in my opinion. Well, yeah, no, thank you for diving into that one as well. And it was actually a pretty good transition into what's next, because you were actually just talking a little bit about political risk. And what are, along with political risk, what are some of the other main types of risks that, you know, people can face uh, when they're thinking about investing or are investing? Well, the biggest, most obvious risk that people think of when they invest is market risk. Could the price go up or down? And if the price could go down, what is the likelihood of that, the frequency of that, or the potential bandwidth of that? How big a correction could you have in a specific sector or security or what have you? Um, market risk matters. It, it absolutely matters. But it doesn't matter in a vacuum. It doesn't matter by itself. There are also um, things like purchasing power or inflation risk. Mm -hmm. So for example, if, if you said, I want the lowest risk portfolio possible, you might not have a portfolio. You might have your money in a shoebox under the swing set. But the fact is, then you're taking on a different kind of risk, which is purchasing power risk, because your money is not growing by inflation, and therefore it's getting less and less valuable every year. Okay. So it's not just, can the market go up or down? If the market can't go down, it doesn't mean it's risk-free. It means it might be market risk-free, but there are other things. So inflation risk, political and legislative risk, tax risk, um, behavioral risk. I think one of the yeah. very biggest risks that most of us face are ourselves. Absolutely. You know, that it's not just the overconfidence. There's, there's anchoring biases. There's, there's, um, there's hindsight biases. There's familiarities. Some people invest in predominantly what they know. Yeah. I've heard of that company. Therefore, I want to invest in it. Well, maybe that's okay. Maybe it's not the most sophisticated approach. So, it's it's important to, I think, try to look at this as objectively as possible and to to try not to look at just market risk as the only component. It's not. 
Yeah. So you could be hurting yourself by not being in the market when you're trying to be safe versus, you know, being in the market and putting everything into a fund that you think is going to make you a million dollars in two weeks. Uh, well, it's, finding, it's finding the balance. It's true. But, but you also have things like liquidity risk or access yeah. to your capital. If, if you're 28 years old and you're putting all of your money in a 401k and don't have any other saving or investments, and you run into a situation where you're unemployed or you need capital, the only place you have to go other than a credit card or some kind of debt is to go to your 401k, which either means a 401k loan, which is by and large always a bad idea, um, mm -hmm. or it means making an early withdrawal from an IRA or paying fees or penalties or taxes. So there's there's risk in that. I, I don't care how well the portfolio is done. If you take a 10% penalty on an ordinary income tax at a point in time where you also have earned income, the rate of return is irrelevant. You just got your teeth knocked down your throat. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. And then previously, you were also talking about behavioral finance, which has been one of the biggest topics over the last few years, just in the finance or investment industry and understanding you can you can often be your worst own enemy which is a scary thought in itself as well because there's so many different things out there that deter people away from wanting to invest and i don't want this all to seem negative but i think you have to have a real understanding of what are the risks when you're getting into investing um in order to do it the right way for you and if you if you're doing this in a thoughtful way and some of your assets are positioned for the long term with some risk, but other assets that you might need to get to sooner are positioned in a way where there's dramatically less risk, you can typically survive, endure, and and maybe even plow through an yeah. adverse market condition or an adverse life event. So it's it's not that we're trying to be negative. I'm certainly not trying to be. Um, oh, yeah. what, I, what I am trying to do is I am trying to say that it it, it is easier to to walk a high tightrope if you have a good net under you. Absolutely. And so sometimes just from that standpoint, um, you know, I wouldn't walk a, a tightrope that was six feet high without a net, but I'd walk one 60 feet high with a good net. <laughs> Not successfully, of course, but, but nonetheless, I, I would do to it. Say, I would love to see it. And I think we could definitely get that on one of the future webinars yeah. just so future uh, everybody, show. Else, everybody else could see it as well. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so once we have an idea of understanding, you know, different types of risks in investing, how do I determine what my personal risk tolerance is based on, you know, my age or, you know, what are my goals? Do I want to buy a house? Am I putting more towards liquid assets or am I focused on my retirement right now? How do you understand what your risk tolerance is? There's a couple ways to answer that question, Cody. And actually, the first thing is that every firm Every investment company, every fund company has what's called a risk tolerance questionnaire. These yes. are sophomoric and not helpful and completely useless, in my opinion. Every firm uses them. In fact, in some cases, they're required. But so much of the answers, so, so much of the, the way in which people answer those questions is based on, uh, on, on recency. Yeah. The way the way a person would answer a risk tolerance questionnaire after a really great year would be totally different than after a really lousy year. That's a good point. It's the same person. So I, I believe so much of that is layered with the behavioral and the emotional and the psychological that risk tolerance questionnaires don't do the job by itself. I think it's much more important to have dialogue um, and to, to talk about some what ifs to figure out what all of us have finite resources. Bill Gates has finite resources. I could live on what he's worth comfortably, but they're still finite. So if you know you can afford to do um, just about anything you want to do, but you can't afford to do everything you might dream up, then it comes down to prioritizing. What's more important? Okay. Is it more important, you know, as families grow, is it more important to have a bigger home or to have a, a second place at the shore? Is it more important to have um, a neighborhood where, where you might pay more for a house, but you can send your kids to public school? Or is it more important to maybe have a more modest home because you want to use the private school system? I mean, some of these things have nothing to do with portfolio risk, but they have everything to do with with uh, some of the risks involved in choosing how to manage them. So okay. I think it starts with that. And then figuring out on an account by account basis, your risk tolerance could be different. And the example yeah. I just used, the risk tolerance I take on in the college plan for my daughter 
is totally different than the risk profile that I have for my IRA that I don't plan to touch for 25 years. Yeah. So I, I think it's okay to understand the risk tolerance is going to be different, not only based on the person or the family or the couple, but also based on the purpose for the funds. Okay. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point that it, it just keeps leading back to, you know, understanding where you're at and what you're trying to accomplish is the root of figuring out, you know, the rest of these answers that we've been discussing. But building off of that, when is the right time to start investing? I know you talked about an emergency fund and, you know, your HVAC goes up and you need those you need funds in order to pay for that damage and maybe they're all locked up in an IRA. So is a good starting point starting with that emergency fund and then from there prioritizing and figuring out where this is the best place to put your investments? It, it, like everything else, it depends on the individual situation. The, the short answer is when answer. is the right time to start investing is the answer is always five years ago. Um, because time is so important. So starting soon is usually better than starting later just because of the time element. Now, that said, not everyone should be investing. Um, for young people who are um, getting clobbered with student loan interest, for example, it may be more important to make extra payments toward a student loan to try and get that albatross from around your neck as opposed to investing. Um, having an emergency fund matters. You know, whether it's three months or six months, it depends on lots of factors, but uh, having enough money to cover the bills if you're suddenly unemployed or you're disabled or something goes wrong um, is very, very helpful and important. And you want to know that you have access to capital. Um, it's also important to make sure you have access to collateral. So if you own a home, right. it means having a line of credit. If you own life insurance or securities portfolio, it's having lines of credit available to you for emergencies. That's what it's for. Um, beyond that, I get asked a lot, like, should I pay down my student loan or should I prepare to buy my first home or should I invest in my company's 401k? Um, and the short answer is to the extent possible, if you are working for a company that has a plan that offers a matching contribution, it is often best to, uh, to participate in that plan, at least to make the maximum, get the maximum possible match. So if you're with a company and they pay 50 cents on the dollar for the first 6%, if you put 6% in, they're gonna give you 3% into the plan. Mm -hmm. That is a better return than you can get on anything so long as you stay long enough to vest in the money. So um, unless you're at, at risk of bankruptcy or you have horrendous personal or, or um, uh, uh, consumer debt, it's usually best to at least participate to the extent that you're getting matches from your employer. Then debt reduction uh, is, is almost always the next step and it's aligned with, if there was a 2A and a 2B, it would be aligned with building an emergency fund. The mer emergency fund is the moat around your castle, Cody. Once you have that, yeah. once you have a, a safety net down um, and you're either debt free or at least adverse debt free, and we've talked about that on other shows, yes. um, then it's time to really get serious about growing some wealth. Yeah, no, uh, I think just a definition that you uh, you briefly spoke about that I think we should dive into is that the idea of the line of credit and you know what is that when when you have a home a home equity line of credit or anything along those terms for those that are listening. Lines of credit are ways to leverage assets that you own and to borrow against them. Um, and there are, are some good ways to do that and some rather poor ways to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, doing a 401k loan is technically using your 401k as collateral. That is disastrous for lots of reasons and should be avoided by everyone as much as possible. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, some property allows you to have collateral with very favorable terms, often interest only, um, and often relatively low rate so that you can get access to capital without having to make a big decision like selling something or taking on a capital gain or moving or, you know, making large life decisions. And so having that, uh, in addition to the emergency fund, having those lines of credit, I think becomes incredibly important. It allows you to have access to capital quickly and inexpensively if you need it, and then you pay it back when you're ready. Um, it's not designed to be long term. It's designed yeah. to be an emergency. It's a it's a, a switch you can flip and then hopefully flip back shortly. You don't want to have a line of credit balance outstanding for 10 years. That's not the point of them. The point of them is to have access to capital when you need it most. And you can open those lines of credit and not 
take anything from it and just have that access. It's that liquid resource without, let's say you're trying to buy a second home or something along those lines. You don't have to go to a bank and get approved or anything like that if you already have that line of credit open. Once you have the line open, and, and in most cases, you can apply for and have a line open with little or no cost, often none. Okay. Um, and it means that when you're ready and you need to deploy capital, you might have a five or 10 year window to use it. So okay. that if you are looking for that second home and you, or, or, or not even a second home, you're just looking to move. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's difficult if you sell your home before you buy your new one then you're homeless for a while and you have to put stuff in storage and you have to figure out where you're going to be and you have to move twice. On the other hand, if you buy a home but then can't sell yours, now you're carrying two mortgages, you're carrying two home expenses, and that's not real pretty. So no, it, it, it is sort of a midpoint between those two uh, scenarios where you can leverage that to, to make a down payment on a new home while preparing to sell your home and then you can pay it off with some of the proceeds from the house you sell. So in that huh. case, it winds up being a, a useful strategy for the short term. No, that was a little bit more in depth. I just, I know you touched on it and I know there, there were a couple of listeners that are scratching their head a little bit and I just wanted to make sure they had a better understanding of that. So thank you. Sure. But uh, as we go into the next slide, you actually already touched on the idea of, you know, getting the employer match but what are some other ways to start investing? And a term that's come up on a couple of webinars is like an HSA or a traditional IRA versus an IRA or versus a Roth IRA, excuse me. Uh, what are some different vehicles that can be used um, in order to start investing because people are realizing they should have started five years ago and yeah. they're ready to take that next step? Some of that's going to depend on your tax situation. If you're, uh, you know, if you're, a young family and right now you're not in your peak earning years yet but you're trying to start building wealth using a 401k and and using a health savings account um, can create some nice tax benefits for sure now for yeah. for folks who aren't super high income the roth ira is a great tool um, okay. because it's a way to put money away where it's never taxed again as long as it's used under the certain rules and, and regs um, and the hsa is even more powerful than that i think they're terrific um, but I also think it's important to have some assets that are not in qualified plans, especially if you're young people. You know, okay. if you're if you're 30 years old, it's important to have some investments that aren't tied to waiting until you're 59 and a half to use them, because a lot can happen in 30 years. A lot can happen in 30 days. So I believe the way to start investing is to start both gradually and regularly. Okay. Um, that means start with uh, your 401k or Roth 401k at just the amount that gets the match. Do the 6% and get the three if that's the way it works at your company. Um, do it every check. You can put in an automatic increase function in a lot of the 401k plans that, that allow you on, the, on January 1st, the next year, now you go from 6%, you go to 7 or you go to 8 And it's automatic, so you don't have to remember to do it. That can be helpful. Um, you can put escalations in there. Um, you can do monthly investments in anything you'd like, $100 a month, $200 a month. It may seem like a small thing and it may not be buying buildings down the road, but it starts the right habits. Yeah. Because the only difference between doing $100 a month and doing $1,000 a month, other than the comma, the only difference is that, that you have to have higher income to be ready for that. Well, if that comes over time and you're already in the habit, it's much easier to change the amount you're investing than it is to start. So get it established, yeah. do something, even if it's modest, and then you'll increase it over time as your wherewithal and your comfort grows. So it really is just building the correct habits now. And by doing that, it'll carry forward and help you reach your goals as you know you continue to get those income in increases that you should be, and you know your assets start to really grow. That's absolutely right. I mean, starting good habits as early as possible and, and instilling them in your in your kids um, or grandkids also matters. I mean, help relatively young people who are maybe not really experienced in this get started and it will empower them over time. Yeah. It's just the, just the tip of the iceberg of, you know, things that we wish we would have learned in high school, right? Well, financial literacy matters, and it's something mm -hmm. that we've been trying to to push not only at the at the state level and legislatively, but also at the school by school level. Um, yeah. Young people need to know how to do this. 
you can yeah. graduate from college without ever having a personal finance course. And that leaves you completely unprepared for the decisions you're making. And by the way, you've already made a huge decision on a student loan that you now are going to have to repay that you had no idea what that meant. Yeah, I know. I'm not picking on you personally, Cody. I'm just saying that's what people do. I'm the one person <laughs> you can't pick on during these yeah. webinars. So bring it I on. I appreciate that. All I right. Know fair enough. Multiple, you know, friends, clients just, oh, I wish I would have known this as I was growing up or anything along those lines. It's, yeah. it's crazy just how much that, you know, we wish we would have been taught that we weren't. And I know here, and we'll touch on a little bit later, just, you know, trying to get those resources out into the world so people really can get this knowledge and start building those habits to find the success that they're looking for. Absolutely. But, yeah. Jumping, jumping a little bit ahead with that. Just, uh, just some things we're looking at here at BFG, but, uh, what should people be avoiding? And I know there's a lot of topics going on in the world right now of the get rich quick, like we talked about that you want to avoid, but what are some things that people should keep an eye out for or red flags when they're looking at investing? Um, one, I think you should avoid being the last on the train. Yes. Um, you know, I used to refer to it as my, my cab driver theory back in the days before Uber when I used to travel a lot and I was in the back of cabs all over the place, um, I, in, in the 1990s, I would have cab drivers tell me which tech stocks they were buying. So help me, I, I, honest truth. And that's usually when you know it's time to be out of tech stocks because it's now reached the point where everyone believes they're tech stock experts. And of course, in 2000, that bubble burst. The same cabs, the same drivers were flipping houses in 2007. And in 08, 09, we know how that worked out for a lot of people. Suddenly rehabbing a house was a ticket to instant wealth until it wasn't. Um, yeah. Today, you have different third rails there. You have crypto as a third rail. You have, yeah. um, you have uh, securities that are no longer backed necessarily um, in the same way that, uh, that, that particularly currencies um, that are backed by the full faith of, of a government entity. Mm -hmm. um, so at, at the end of the day, I would say it's important to avoid, number one, trying to time anything. Number two, piling into something um, where you think you're going to get a quick buck. It just, it's just not the way to do it. Um, and lastly, I, I would say the things to avoid often are psychological. Avoid inertia. Avoid okay. analysis paralysis, where you're you're looking at so many things, you're looking for something perfect, so you don't do anything until you find it. Well, you'll never do anything. Um, True. It means it means getting started in a meaningful way. I would avoid inertia. Um, I would also avoid micromanaging. I'd avoid looking at it every day and thinking, oh, should I buy it or sell it or what? I, I would time nothing. I would park it and forget it. Make sure your statements are reconciled. And beyond that, don't spend a ton of time looking at the at the details, um, whether you're doing it yourself or whether you've outsourced this um, to a professional. I, looking at it every day is not good for you. I mean, all you need to all you need to do is see a lousy day on Wall Street, and then you look at your accountant, and it's down ten thousand dollars that day, and yeah. you're you're ready to panic over something what you forgot it was up ten thousand three days ago. Like, it, it's just one of those things that is a a um it's an ongoing way to train your brain not to uh, react emotionally yeah. and it's just another case in point of how automation can be super helpful in building that habit of having everything go in and then you're checking on it you know a few times throughout the year and you know when tax season comes to make sure everything's in order but set it and forget it i think is is one of the big takeaways that you can uh, you can grab from this Generally, I think that's the best way to go. Set it, forget it, but also feed it. Yeah. You know, it's it's not enough to park it and ignore it. Um, but I think it's okay to park it and then feed it regularly. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, building off that, you know, we figured out what type of investor are, we are. You know, we've started investing. We We have an idea of what to avoid. This can be a lot. This can be overwhelming for a lot of people because they're going to have questions of, should I put into my employer plan? Should I put it into my health savings account? Yeah. Which one is right for me and figuring out how am I unique and what is the best decision? When is the right time to ask for help? That's a great question because people don't like to ask for help with anything. You know, Directions you and I know, and thank goodness for GPS, you don't have the embarrassment that, that we had as younger people where we had to stop and ask somebody for directions, which men didn't do. 
by the way. Um, nope. None of us like to ask for help because asking for help feels like somehow there's something deficient or weak about about this. So yeah. what I would say is, uh, when is the right time to ask, maybe not for help, but for some guidance, um, for yeah. some oversight, even for a second opinion. Um, and I, I think as soon as you're, you're in your life, it has gotten complicated enough that maybe you don't have time to spend on all of these things, or maybe you choose to spend your time some other way, whether it's working on your occupation or playing with your kids or doing something you love to do. I think there's a great benefit to outsourcing those things that you don't really enjoy and have a great talent for. So uh, I, I tend to think that the reason why financial advisors can be valuable mm -hmm. isn't necessarily because we're the smartest people in the room. Um, it's because we are going to look at things in a dispassionate way, and it's because we can look at everything with um, with a set of eyes that is really neutral. Uh, and and I think that's really helpful, especially with a married couple, or with partners. If you if you have two two uh, adult people in the household, they're going to have different understandings and feelings and impressions on not just money in general, but on goals, on housing, on education, on retirement, on vacations, on you name it, on groceries. Cody, yeah. they're going to think about what they spend on groceries, and the things couples fight about the most are kids and money. And while I can be of no help to them on the kids front, um, on the money front, having those dialogues does matter and it does make things more comfortable for people. And um, I, I think that if I didn't do this for a living, I would absolutely hire a professional to do this for me because it's a lot to know. Um, I don't do my own tax returns, not because I don't understand taxes, but because I despise that. And I don't want to do that. I want to pay somebody to do a great job with my tax returns. I'm not a lawyer, so I have a lawyer. I have an insurance agent. I have a real estate agent uh, and a mortgage broker. And, you know, I have resources and, and I think it's okay to have subcontractors out there. And, you know, I even have a financial advisor. My wife and I sit yeah. down with one of the other advisors at BFG and it's great because I can take off my planner hat, put on my husband hat and be relatable. Absolutely. So I don't know that anyone should do this themselves. Um, and I, I don't mean just the investment piece. Investing is not difficult. There, there are algorithms, there are computer programs. You can do that on your own. You can get the, the solutions from a computer. What you can't get is you can't get the, the interaction and the, the psychology. You, the computer doesn't know what it's like to lose a parent or to have a yeah. child with special needs That's true. Or, to have, um, or to be worried about a job loss. You know, a computer is not going to help you when you lose and sleep at night over something like that. And so the human aspect of this becomes so valuable just because it is um, it, it gives you some guide rails. Mm -hmm. It helps you maybe avoid the big mistake. It doesn't mean you're going to get rich quicker or anything like that. It might just help you avoid some of the third rails. And um, so I, I think as soon as you're in a position where you're 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 busy and your life is complicated enough, and this isn't something you want to become an expert on, then, then absolutely get some guidance. And that guidance could be one time, it could be ongoing, it could be in a, it can take a lot of different forms. But I don't know anyone who wouldn't benefit from some oversight here unless, unless you were really dealing with a, a, a true bankruptcy situation and someone yeah. who truly had no resources and needed more of a, uh, an attorney or a social worker or both. And, and you know, in, in those situations, a financial advisor is not going to be particularly helpful, but um, if you have income and if you have assets and if you're looking to grow one or both of them uh, and trying to position yourself to have work be optional someday, yeah, I think it. I think it's worth um, having a second opinion on that. That's a professional one and that's objective. No, I could not agree more with you. I think you put that really well. Um, do you have any last thoughts on investing in general before, uh, I think we got time for a question or two before, uh, our time runs out today. I'd love to know if there's questions from the, from the audience. I, I, I would say yeah. in terms of, in terms of last, uh, statements, um, it's don't wait, start, start now, um, take inventory, begin looking at your finances and look at them honestly, whether it's just you or whether it's you and a partner. Look at them honestly. Look at your debt. Look at your spending. Mm -hmm. Look at your savings. Look at your investments. Um, and start to, to really judge where you are now and to think about where you want to be. And let's build a path. I mean, it's not going to be linear. It's not a straight line. 
And a lot of times it's exponential. So that's why time is so important. But it, it, this, is, this is really, it's a journey that is best started five years ago, no matter how old you are. Um, and so with that being said, start immediately. Inertia is very, very dangerous here. You, you don't want to just sit and do nothing because it will not make the problem better. It will not make solutions more ample and it will, make, it will not make outcomes more favorable. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a great way to lead into the Q&A. So, uh, yeah, let's hear what we have to say here. Yeah, I think we got Sarah who can chime in, who's our director of marketing, who has been uh, taking in all the questions that everyone has written in. So if uh, Sarah, are you there? Yeah, if you haven't written one in, you can go to the chat box and do that as well. Yep. I think we got her. Great. All right. I'll, let's get to that first question. Do you have a particular sector that you think would be a good idea to look into? Um, that, that's that's a funny question, considering we just talked about trying to avoid tactical timing. But, but yep. since someone asked it, I would say there are certainly things that appear to be um, poised for some growth in a post-pandemic uh, world. Um, I think one of them is financial companies. I think the the yeah. unbelievable transfer of wealth between one generation and another is going to create enormous opportunities in the financial world. Um, so that's one. I would say healthcare, because people are living longer, but not necessarily living better. And and uh, healthcare is a spot that needs to be thought and rethought and rethought on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, but it's also one that's not going anywhere. It will be here. Uh, and so I think that matters. Uh, and lastly, it sounds a little silly, but um, but I, I would say technology is so pervasive that it's difficult to say what a technology company is anymore because every company is a technology company. It's just part of what you do. Um, but that said, um, the real innovators in the tech space who are creating um, real material change and efficiencies and systems and, and processes and so forth. Um, and let's face it, in new gadgets, everybody wants the latest, greatest. Um, I think that's still a, a really viable spot as well. Yeah. Awesome. Well. Thank you. That was Caleb's question. We have um, one question for, from Stephanie. I think it's a really important one to get to. Mm -hmm. um, what's the first step for finding a good fit financial advisor for us? How do we know they're a good fit and not someone will take advantage of us, especially knowing our financial situation? That is a fantastic question. It, it is a good question. And I, and I think it's, um, I, I think it's, there's a couple of different answers for that. I, I, I wrote, don't retire, graduate and published the book recently. And one of the chapters is dedicated entirely to interviewing a, a financial advisor. And what are the types of questions um, that should be uh, that should be asked, and what do the answers mean, um, so that you can really understand that. Um, there are some resources that we've put out that are uh, available and that are free as well um, to talk about what the financial planning process is. Um, and if you go, I see it's now on the screen. If you go to BrotmanMedia.com, you'll find some of those resources. Um, yes. You're also welcome to use the QR code on the screen. Uh, Cody, I'm stealing your thunder, sir. I'm uh, sorry for that. But, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, that, that, that QR code, it's, it's a money bag, I think, but part of it reminds me of the volleyball in Castaway, actually. Um, Wilson. do you see that at all? Does that look at all like, like, uh, Wilson? Anyway, uh, um, if you, if you use that QR code, you can schedule a call with one of our, uh, eight financial advisors. Um, it will cost you nothing. It's an opportunity to get to know us and to see if we could be helpful to you. Uh, and you can schedule it right on your on your mobile device just by scanning that now. Yeah. And actually to build off that, Eric, just based on these webinars that, you know, we have that free consultation with you and let's say you want to move forward and, you know, work with us in building a relationship. There's actually a 10 percent off discount that I, uh, I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of off of, you know, the initial fee just to start the relationship. That's coming out of your pocket, right, Cody? Pockets are small over here, so sure. <laughs> but um, no, I think I think we got time for one more. If uh, if Sarah, you got another question, because Eric was. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't see the chat box on my screen, but if there's a few, we'll we'll certainly take them. Yeah, we got another one or two. All right. Um, I know you're going to enjoy this question from uh -oh, Jen. God. What do you think about crypto mining? Uh, <laughs> I. I <laughs> I, I, you know, this is a family show. I can't, I can't tell you what I think. Um, 
I, I think it is, um, I think it's a very dangerous thing. Um, I, I think it's grounded in and based on um, nothing tangible. And it, it, you're talking about investing in something that has no um, proven use, no intrinsic value. It doesn't create anything or produce anything. And um, people have made some of them a lot of money doing this only because other people were willing to pay more for it than they were. Um, and I, I suspect it's going to end very badly. And, and I, of course, I want this webinar to age well. And if three years from now, you know, the dollar bill has been replaced by a Bitcoin or something, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'll look pretty dumb. But I, I just don't feel like there's a I don't feel like there's an intrinsic value to it. And so I'm avoiding it like like uh, like it was contagious. So what oh, you're saying is really I well. shouldn't move my 401k into Dogecoin? Uh, I wouldn't. I would uh, I would tell you not to do that. I, I know there there's some there's some very big name folks out there who are starting to talk about the um, the legitimacy of crypto. And at the end of the day, I'm concerned. I'm not convinced, but I'm concerned that they may be doing that because they own some and they know that they have enough influence that they can create a buying frenzy, make some money, and then leave uh, others holding the bag. And, uh, you know, that's not to suggest that everyone is sinister, um, but certainly I, I think that that is a real possibility. And it's still a largely unregulated, um, uh, you know, wild west. And so I'm, I'm I, if, if it becomes a mainstream thing and it becomes regulated in a, in a meaningful way, then I may feel differently. But for right now, I, I, I think, yes, you should avoid it. I think that's well put, Eric. But uh, Sarah, you got time for one more. All right, I'm going to go with the question that I like the most because, as <laughs> two of you know, this is something that I'm extra passionate about. Yep. How it's about, and when... this about dogs? It, yes. Yeah, so should sure I invest dogs. in all my money in puppies? Um, no. How and when <laughs> can I start teaching this to my kids? How can you start teaching it to your kids? Um, financial literacy is hard to come by in school. Um, in fact, you know, our team, Cody in, included, put out a, a course, a financial literacy course, um, which um, which is free, which is available at bfguniversity.com, and you can get there through the the website on the screen. Um, but it's it's a it's a starter course, and it's great for middle or high school kids or college kids, young adults, or even just anybody who wants a refresher. And I think it's a it's a neat way to um, it's a neat way to to take things like cash and debt and some of the real basics and make them relatable in a in an interactive way. So um, I would do that. I would also say there are nonprofits that do a lot of work in this space. Junior achievement being, I think, the best of them, where you can find resources for your school or for your kids or community, and um, it's international, so you can find them anywhere. And Eric, I think building on that, going into summer vacation, it could be something, you know, keep your kids engaged and ready to go and tuned up for, you know, going into the new school year, something to keep them busy and make sure that they continue learning throughout the summer as well. Well, the kids can enjoy that, that online course, the adults summer reading at the beach should be don't retire, graduate. Yes, um, that, that, that is, uh, that is the, the best summer reading assignment I can give everybody just, oh, just because the the feedback the feedback we've had on it has been so positive um it's it just real exciting yeah i think it's a book that needs to be on everybody's shelves and i think it will be but um no sarah thank you for all those questions uh i'm gonna pull up a pretty screen with all of eric's uh information just you, thank you again eric you know i know you got That's a big fun. or a busy schedule and every time you make time for these webinars in order to put a little bit more information into the, into the world and, you know, really help people reach their goals and everything they're trying to achieve. So a huge thank you. Um, it's not going to be the last time I'm going to keep pulling you back for more. So uh, don't, don't <laughs> think that, you're getting out of this. Is that a promise or a threat? <laughs> it's a little bit of both, but uh, okay. no, just a huge thank you and uh, enjoy the beach a little bit, I think for everybody. And uh, we'll definitely be talking to you again soon. Sounds perfect. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, no problem. Uh, for everybody that tuned in today, I also just wanted to say thank you. Uh, we wouldn't be doing these webinars without you. And I hope you were able to take some valuable information from today. And hopefully you've set up a consultation just to speak with one of our advisors um, to help answer any of the questions maybe we didn't get to today. 
uh, or just you know more specific questions to you and see if there's any way we can provide you with a little bit of value to, to help you reach your goals. But our next webinar is gonna be July 21st. Uh, I'm pulling Lena back in, so if uh, you tuned into our uh, marriage webinar, which was a fun one, she'll be back. And the focus of this webinar is gonna be on buying a house. So for those of you who have come for the first time, thanks for joining. For those of you that come back, thank you for joining. And hopefully I'll, uh, I'll see you all again on July 21st. But uh, thanks for everything and I'll talk to you guys soon.